Hello everybody, I'm Arden. Today we're back again to talk about Applied Energistics 2, or AE2 for short. And today's discussion is going to be about the cables and the channel system. Because I found talking to people over the years, one of the biggest obstacles they've run into is just understanding how the channels work. Because I really feel like they're just kind of misnamed. So the first thing I want to mention is that there is a config option to just disable the channels entirely. So you don't have to even deal with the compilation. I find that they make you think out your base plans a little bit better and I always leave it enabled, but that's one of the first suggestions you'll always see people make. So if it really is a massive obstacle, by all means, turn that option off. So the quickest way I would explain this is that the channels are really just the limit of number of machines you can connect to a single cable. Not as complicated as it sounds, but we'll get into the, what that means in a minute. So the first thing we should probably do is discuss the various types of cables and the different variants among each. Starting over here on the left, you see that there is quartz fiber. This is only used to pass power between different a to networks and machines. You notice how they won't even connect up to each other like this or even on these corners, but it will connect it to the block as if this was going into a machine. If we put another normal network cable in here, you know that it joins them together and would now pass power between these two things and we could continue off of this. It is not useful for setting up a network on its own, however. These next cables right here are the glass cables, which are the most basic type of cable that can hold eight channels. There's nothing really special about these. They come in a whole bunch of different colors. All of the standard dyeable colors in Minecraft, and this is true of all of the upcoming cable types as well. Of note, these cables do not connect together if they are different colors, but you notice down here at the bottom, I have a purple one connecting to the red one because this is the generic Flux cable. This is an uncolored cable and acts as a universal connector. It will connect to any color, as you can see as I just added the blue one down here. Coming over here, we have covered cables, which are basically identical to the glass cables, except they look slightly different. There's nothing really special about these, and it, the same thing applies. The different colors won't connect to each other, and this gray one down here is the same as the purple one down there. If I were to put this blue cable between them, the whole thing would be connected together. Over here, we have dense cables, which the primary difference between these is, while these can hold eight channels, these can hold 32, effectively four cables worth of these, and are useful for running trunks through your base that you span other cables off of to connect different lines of machines or networks together with. So that's it at a basic level. There is one other variant we should talk about that is super important though. What I'm referring to are the various smart cables and they come in all the same colors as all the other cables and play by the same rules. They are nearly the same as the various covered cable types, but with one significant difference. If you look at it, you can see how many channels they have used. And obviously from here, you, we have a normal, the normal size cables that go from eight into a dense that now uses 32. Now the trick here is any number of devices you connect to this cable will use up one of these channels. It includes the various terminals, which I provided power for just to, for the purpose of this example, which now is using one channel all the way down the line. But any sort of A2 device uses it, including any sort of exporters or importers, storage buses, the various pattern processors, the the ME interfaces, any of them. And now we're using five of eight in this channel all the way down. If we continue doing this, we can take it up to eight of eight and we're all good to go. And this right here is where the problems tend to come in for most people. Because we add a ninth to it, the channel turns off. And depending on which version of AE2 you're playing on, this may not actually show that error message. You may not actually know why it's not working. It may just be black and say device online. So if you ever run into this situation where it just blacks out like this, well, you've got too many devices on the channel. But if we go back to this, we now have seven of eight and the whole thing works correctly. Now, the problem with this, however, is this gives the false sense of how things work because this says seven of eight and we can in theory go up to 32 here, except without an ME controller, this will not actually work. Because if we go up to nine on here and we put another cable on, we can do that. And we can do this and the whole thing still turns off because without an ME controller connected to the network, it can only handle eight channels on a subnet of its own like this. 
if we now take an ME controller and put it into the network, well, it all works. And you notice that this says 7, 8 here. This is 9 of 32 because this 2 is now coming in from the side here and is now siloed out from this cable going in this direction because it's this one right here that acts as the connector into the two of them. If we instead take that out, put the ME controller in between, this says 7, 8, but this now says 2 of 32 because these are now on their own subnet and now work separately from this. And we can very easily expand off from the controller like that, adding channels off in a whole bunch of different directions and a whole bunch of different colors so they don't tangle into each other. The other thing that's important to note about the ME controller is it's actually a multi-block structure. We can put in any sort of rectangular shape and this all acts as a single network now. Which means we can put the cables off in the other directions off of any of these faces in any colors we want and it would expand the whole network. And it can go even bigger and bigger and bigger as long as you have enough power to power the whole thing. But this doesn't work because it cannot be a filled rectangle, unfortunately. But what you can do is make any sort of cube shape out of it that you would like. But the instant you do anything like this, it ultimately breaks the whole thing again. Now that said, you can put any number of power providers or batteries or any other devices hooked up into this that you want or cables just infesting the whole thing. It all works out fine that way. There is one other topic we should talk about because this is one of the reasons why you would want to expand the cube out like this. And this is to do peer-to-peer -peer networking, which is a way of collapsing bound a whole bunch of devices into a single channel. All right, so say for instance, I have this network of exporters that's actually gonna be connected to a bank of machines or something. And I wanna be able to run this back to my ME controller system, but I don't want it to use up a bunch of channels and I would like to be able to hook up a bunch more of these to it. Well, you can accomplish that with the P2B tunnels pretty easily. So what we wanna do is we want to run a cable almost all the way up to this network, but not quite to it. Because right here, we then need to add a P2P tunnel in facing the outgoing network so that this face faces into this machine. And then we wanna drop a cable to connect this, but you notice that this still says device offline. That's because we have an unlinked P2P tunnel. Now I should note there's a bunch of these tunnel types. The ME P2P tunnel is a generic type that will pass any type of traffic through it, but there are other types that will restrict it to a single channel type, energy, fluids, items, etc. And to actually use this, you need to connect this up somewhere on your controller. It does not have to be on the same cable it's even on. It actually doesn't even have to be the same controller. We could subnet this off onto a separate one. Like for instance, we can come over to this side. We can come in and put a P2P tunnel on right here and connect this up to our network. You notice that there are now eight of eight channels being used when there were seven previously, because this now counts as its own. You notice that it also says unlinked in frequency 000. What we need to do is shift right click it to give it a frequency onto this white memory card here, which this doesn't have to be the white one. It can be any color. The color is pretty much irrelevant. And then come over to this one and right click it. And now you'll notice that we are now using one of eight channels here because it's using the P2B tunnel. And the P2B tunnel now has six of eight lit up with the various devices on it. And this is also now still eight of eight. So we have effectively used one channel going into here to light up this whole bank of machines. I should further note that P2B tunnels aren't necessarily one-to-one -one even, because we could add another one right here with another device, just toss an export bus on there, and link this in, same as this, and now this is now using the same, now this is using two channels, but these are now all linked together in the same one. And they all come into the same face on the ME controller, and this is more about conserving the faces on the ME controllers, more so than conserving the channels at this point. So once you understand the basics of that, it becomes very easy to, frankly, wire up a whole bunch of things into a single dense cable line to run a trunk through your whole base, all powered off of P2P lines, running in a small, tiny number of channels, powering a whole huge chunk of your base. So hopefully that was useful to you. 
The one other thing I did not mention, and I'd be remiss if I at least didn't bring it up, is that in addition to the various cable colors, there's also the cable anchor, which will stop cables from merging together if you're deciding to do everything in Flug's cables for some bizarre reason. But you notice that these two have now not joined, and we can now fork them off into different directions. And they'll be good to go. You can also anchor them onto the sides of machines for whatever reason you don't want on this controller. We can keep it from joining there as well. So hopefully this gives you a slightly better understanding of how A2 cables and channels actually work. And next time we can go into some of the actual uses for all this and what some of these machine pieces actually do. If you found this interesting or entertaining, please give me a like or subscribe if you're new. As always, I'm Ard. Thank you for watching and have a nice day.